my name is Sheila, Children and Youth Services Librarian at Vancouver Island Regional Library. And I'm back again this week for another one of our special weekly events. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples of each of the communities in our service area and represented by those in attendance at today's virtual program. I am coming to you today from the unceded territory of the Tsunami people, whose historical relationship with the land continues to this day. Uh, welcome to our special Summer Reading Club weekly virtual event, and our very special guest today is Dr. Jenny Seide Gibbons, who is an astronaut with the Canadian Space Agency. Jenny will be giving you a short presentation on her amazing career path and work as an astronaut, and then you can ask her questions. So please put your questions in the comments below right now so that we can get them to her in time. And please join me in offering a great big warm welcome to Jenny Seide Gibbons. Thank you so much, Sheila. That was a lovely introduction. And uh, I just want to say I'm so pleased to virtually at least be able to join you today. I wish that I could be there with you in person to um, take part in your reading club. I think this is absolutely wonderful. Um, but hopefully we can settle for a virtual event uh, today until we can actually meet in person once things get a little bit better out there. Um, so I'm just going to start by giving you a brief presentation about um, generally what Canada's space program is like and what it's like when you um, when you do become an astronaut. And uh, then we can um, answer any questions you might have. And I'm pretty open to um, whatever questions those might be. So please uh, don't be shy. Ask me whatever you, whatever you like. And yeah, we should have lots of time for those at the end. Um, make sure you guys can see me here as well. There we go. Okay, so uh, first of all, I know you guys probably know a little bit about space already, so you probably, many of you already know that we have been to the moon around 50 years ago. Uh, humans set foot on the moon for the first time, and that brought us a lot of really wonderful um, understanding about our solar system, our natural satellite, um, the space around us, but also a lot of perspective and understanding of our own planet as well. Uh, and I think this picture sums that up really well. This is the wonderful Earth rise picture taken on one of the Apollo missions. Um, and I just think it's so inspiring. This perspective was completely new to us when we uh, when we undertook this amazing space mission and, and accomplished something that so many people had dreamed about for so long. Um, so I always like to start by showing people this, this picture to talk about perspective and the perspective that um, space gives to us. It's pretty exciting beyond being adventurous and, and uh, kind of it's new, this new front for all of us to explore and for every human to take part in. It also offers a lot of, a lot, offers us a lot of perspective when we look back at our own planet. I really love that. But for me, um, my journey in space has just started. I'm a rookie like probably most all of you. Um, I've not yet been to space and my journey to space did not start with a rocket. Um, again, I haven't been to space yet. Um, this is the rocket that launched those astronauts to the moon, the Saturn V rocket. Uh, it didn't start with this new rocket. This is the Falcon Heavy, a SpaceX rocket. SpaceX just started launching humans uh, to the International Space Station, which is pretty cool. But for me, it started with this rocket. So this was my very first rocket. I was interested in space when I was really young. Um, I was also interested in being creative and I loved solving problems. So for me, those two things, being creative and wanting to solve problems and just a general interest in exploring and science um, really set me down a path of becoming an engineer. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with what an engineer is, but an engineer is someone who uses science to solve problems and improve people's lives. So it, it, uh, it requires a lot of creativity, a lot of understanding about the way the world works around you, and it's just a really fun thing to do. So I think a lot of people are actually engineers without necessarily knowing that they are yet. This is a picture of me when I became an engineer. I'm actually doing uh, an experiment on a microgravity flight. That's why I'm floating in this picture. And this is what kind of set me off to uh, start down this pathway of being interested in um, not just engineering, but fire science. 
So my type of engineering, the type of engineering that I studied, was combustion. I really wanted to study fire and learn the way that it worked. So I went to school for a long time. I eventually became a professor and um, I started teaching and I was very happy doing that. I thought that that was what I was going to do for uh, the rest of my life. Um, but then the Canadian Space Agency started to advertise that they were going to recruit astronauts. And I hadn't thought about being an astronaut in a very long time, but when they started that recruitment, this is the, the ad that came out, astronauts wanted, I thought, huh, that looks pretty cool. And I remember that little rocket that I made when I was only a couple of years old and my mom saved it all these years. And um, I just thought that that would be a really interesting thing to be a part of. Canada has this amazing space program. We're so lucky to have it. So whether you want to be an astronaut or any other type of scientist or engineer or anyone who's involved with a space program, I think presents a lot of really cool opportunities to study and, and maybe one day go to space yourself. So I applied to be an astronaut and it started one of the most challenging years of my life. Here's a, here are actually a couple of pictures of me um, in the actual recruitment process. And during the recruitment process, um, the people who were running it, the Canadian Space Agency, they were looking for a few different things. So they wanted to see uh, whether you could work well in a group. So a lot of these tasks were done in groups of people, not necessarily in the pictures, but um, you had to be able to work as a team to cohesively try and uh, solve a problem or achieve a goal. And I do that pretty much every day in my job now. Um, when you're an astronaut, you are part of an enormous team trying to accomplish a mission. Uh, you have to have some sort of background in science or engineering, math, medicine. Um, I had that being an engineer. Um, and you also have to be in pretty good health. So you have to look after your body, be able to complete tasks that are physical. You have to be eating the right sort of foods and um, really know how to, again, carry out a task, whether you're by yourself or part of the team. But that physicality is very important as well. So the application process was about a year long. I can answer any question that you have about it. Just ask me as soon as we're finished up here. And eventually, I became one of Canada's newest astronauts. So here's a picture of me with um, some other people who are in our core now. I was selected along with Josh Hutrick. He's standing in the middle of this picture. And we joined the core along with David St. Jacques who is directly underneath me in the photo, and Jeremy Hansen, who is on the outside of the photo. Um, these are wonderful guys to be a part of the core with, and we work together all the time to eventually fly in space and contribute as much as we can to Canada's space program. Uh, we're in this picture in front of one of the very fast jets that we fly as astronauts. We use that as a as training to eventually fly in space. Helps a lot when you're flying in a crew of two, so in this picture, I'm actually flying that jet with Jeremy Hansen, one of the guys in that picture. Um, and we're learning how to make decisions under pressure as part of the team. So we kind of consider it pretty similar to space flight and we learn a lot from those flights. We also do, I mean, our training is pretty diverse. We do things like learn another language. We're learning Russian right now because when we fly in space, we it's an international effort and we fly with our Russian colleagues. So. Uh, we have to be able to communicate with them if we're going to be in a team with them. Um, we learn how to manipulate the robotic arm, which is um, really Canada's big contribution to the International Space Program. Um, and we learn how to do a spacewalk, which is really cool. Um, here's a picture of me training to do a spacewalk. You get in this this big spacesuit, and you learn how to manipulate all the tools that you would need to manipulate in space but you do it in a pool. The reason why you do it in a pool is because they can add weights and floats to your spacesuit to make you neutrally buoyant, to kind of stay um, exactly where you're put or where you put yourself in the water. It's not exactly like being in space. You're still in a 1G or 1 gravity environment because you're on Earth, obviously, um, but it allows you to, to be neutrally buoyant and to stay in the same place in front of your work site so you can accomplish any sort of task. And that's how we practice before we actually fly in space. So I love that training. It's actually some of my favorite training that we do so far. All of this is uh, to eventually fly in space. And when people fly in space now, they go to the International Space Station. This is a picture of the International Space Station. 
Um, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of it now, but it's actually a, an, an incredible achievement. Um, the International Space Station has been orbiting the Earth uh, 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. It's not that far off. It's actually lower Earth orbit. It's pretty close to Earth um, for 20 years. That's pretty impressive. If you think about this collaboration between all of these different nations on Earth, what else can you think of that they've all collaborated to that's had this long-term success? Absolutely incredible. It's about as big as a five-bedroom house, um, and three to six people live there at, at one time. Right now, there are five people in space on the International Space Station. And one of our Canadian astronauts, David, uh, he actually spent just over half a year there uh, last year. And it was really cool to see him up there um, floating around and doing all this amazing science, learning about the, how the human body works in space and looking back at our own planet to learn about it. So that's what people are doing now, but what are they gonna do in the future? So here's a picture of the class that I trained with. We're nicknamed the turtles, actually. Um, here we are on a, a leadership outdoor expedition. We're in Canyonlands in Utah. Um, and on this trip, we did a lot of really cool geology. Now, if you start to think about why an astronaut might need geology, the answer comes up pretty quickly if you think about uh, the idea of going back to the moon. So this is what next. Um, after the International Space Station, the next space station that all these nations of Earth are going to collaborate and build is called the Lunar Gateway. And the Lunar Gateway is a smaller space station which is actually going to orbit the moon. And it's going to allow us to gain all of that insight and a lot more, understand a lot more about our planet and our own moon, similar to the Apollo missions, but hopefully in a very sustainable way like the International Space Station. It's going to allow us to go to the surface of the moon pretty easily. And actually, Canada has uh, Canada's big contribution to this space station is also going to be a robotic arm. So it's called CanArm3, the third generation of the Canada, Canadian robotic arm. Um, and it's going to be AI-enabled, which is artificial intelligence-enabled, which is really cool. It's going to be um, a lot more autonomous than our current robotic arm. And if you're interested in robotics generally, we should talk more about it because it's a pretty cool project. Now, all of this might seem pretty far away, but I just want to talk very briefly about the zero place, about how space affects your life every day. So uh, space has a huge positive impact on everyday lives. We might not always realize it, but like monitoring how ice is in our heart at any given time, um, fire spread, even the health of our, our soil and how crops grow, how our food to each other, how we orient ourselves on our planet and directions. All of that is completely enabled by uh, space technology and satellites. So even though we might not realize it, um, we're using space every day, whether it's, again, to get our food or it's something more urgent like monitoring climate change or a response to a natural disaster. All of that requires a lot of input from the space industry. So that's part of the way that you guys are taking part in Canada's space industry as we speak, maybe without knowing it. So the final thing I want to talk about before I take you guys' questions is um, I want to put out a call to all Canadians who are in grades 6 to 9. So if you're listening and you're in grades 6, 7, 8, 9, or you will be uh, within the next year, then you should look at the Canadian Space Agency's Junior Astronauts Program. So there's a lot of really incredible activities on the Canadian Space Agency website that you can participate in. They all have to do with becoming an astronaut or some of the skills that you might need to become an astronaut, like science and technology, fitness and nutrition, and teamwork and communication. And I really think that you should check them out. They're a lot of fun, and there's some great prizes that you can uh, hopefully participate in as well. So that's all that I wanted to share with you formally for now, but I would love to hear your questions, uh, get to know what you're interested in. Um, we can talk about space or whatever else like. So thank you for having me and please ask away. So the first question is from Abby. And before I ask her question, Abby wanted you to know that it's so cool that you are from Calgary because she used to live in Southwest Alberta. 
Oh, and awesome, Abby. That's great to hear. I'm glad to talk to another Southwest Albertan. <laughs> you would like to know what you are most looking forward to in space. Hmm. This is a, a great question. I mean, it requires so much work to to fly in space, a lot of training and a lot of effort from many different people. I mean, not it won't be just me. It's an enormous, enormous team that prepares someone to fly in space. The people who actually build the space station or the rocket or train you to do science when you're up there or the person who's actually developing the science. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm most excited for a lot of their dreams to kind of come into fruition and to be able to share in that achievement with them. I think that'll be really special to talk to all the trainers when I'm actually up there or um, I get the opportunity to fly. The other thing that I think would be really special is looking back at the earth and seeing places that I'm familiar with. So places that I know friends or family are, or like I, I, I just find that a really wonderful concept, the idea of being in space and looking back at the earth and seeing every place you've ever been up till then. Just imagine how many wonderful memories you're gonna have and how you're gonna feel about your planet. I've heard that's, that's pretty special. Wow. I almost want to go now. <laughs> and just for a little bit of a turn, Jude and Evan would like to know where are the bathrooms on the rocket and the space station? Great question. So the capsules on the rockets are pretty small. So usually it's it's a similar sort of situation that you might have in like uh, a really small toilet if you were camping or something like that. Um, it's not a lot of luxury. <laughs> There's not a lot of space on the actual rocket. But once you actually get to the International Space Station and you're in a more permanent living um, situation, there are actually are two, soon to be three toilets on the International Space Station. Um, so obviously things are a little bit different because you're in a zero G rather than a one G environment. So rather than gravity to move things away from your body, you have airflow and all these different systems that wonderful engineers have designed so that we can live in space. Um, so when you're on the way up, there might not be a lot of privacy. There's some, but once you're there, it's much better. Good. Uh, Luca, who is nine, would like to know how you drink in space. Oh, good question, Luca. Okay, so um, I, I tend to compare this to camping a lot. So um, for eating and drinking in space, obviously we're pretty restricted on what we can actually bring because um, food and especially water is very heavy. So we tend to fly water, but then actually we recycle it up there. So we have systems that um, recycle the water that we use they draw water out of the air and filter it and turn it back into drinking water. So it's a pretty amazing system that we've developed in order to be sustainable up there. And actually, that's one of the um, technologies that we use here on Earth now in remote regions in order to provide clean water to people. So um, the water filtration system on the space station is pretty neat. Um, I'll also talk briefly about uh, food too, because this is kind of a related question. And um, when you're camping, if you if you have things like dehydrated food um, that you have to add water back into and heat up or something like that. Um, it's pretty similar on the space station. You kind of get a few um, preference items, but uh, mostly it's like camping. And I have to say the food and the drink is pretty good. We also get like some juices that you add water to that are pretty nice things that, that would remind you of uh, maybe tanks, not the right, <laughs> the right comparison, but similar, similar. <laughs> All right. Um... I don't have a name on this one, but the question is, what types of training did you go through uh, other than the ones that you spoke about? Mm, so I spoke briefly about training um, how to move the robotic arm. That's pretty cool work that we do and completely enabled by Canada. Um, I trained to do a spacewalk. I trained to fly that jet. Um, and that just teaches us a lot about, again, how to work as a team. Um, trying to speak the Russian language. We learn every system on the International Space Station inside and out, how to fix it, how it works. Um, we're the ones who are going to be fixing it if it breaks, so we work with the engineers who built it to learn as much as we can about it. Um, and we also do a lot of training on how to be a good team member. So things about how to look after people on your team, how to effectively lead, how to be an effective follower, how to solve problems together, how to take care of each other and yourself. I think that's pretty important and is sometimes overlooked. So there's also a pretty strong emphasis on that. Great. Dennis would like to know what qualities do you think helped you get selected for the astronaut program? Mm -hmm. 
the astronaut selection program is such a big, big process. And there were all of these amazing Canadians in it, people who I was so grateful to meet, but wouldn't necessarily have had the opportunity to meet otherwise. So it's kind of a mystery how it all works out and how, um, excuse me, if you are lucky enough to get chosen at the end, how that happens. Um, because again, there are all these incredible Canadians that I thought would have been great at the job um, in the recruitment process as well. Um, but I think what probably helped me a lot is um, you have to be very determined and very gritty. So you have to, they, they really stress you out in the recruitment process. They probably scare you. They face you with situations that sometimes don't necessarily have a solution and are very uncomfortable to participate in. And they see how you react and not only how you solve the problem, but how you treat other people when you're trying to solve it with them. So I think having the drive to, um, to really want to complete the problem, even when things got really tough. And knowing that if I slacked off, then someone on my team was going to have to pick that up and do more work. I think hopefully, um, hopefully that helped me. Um, and also just getting along with people, I think, is really important, too. Again, that's overlooked a bit. But um, really, at the end of the day, if no one wants to go to space with you and spend six months in a really small, small capsule with you, then um, you're not going to go, <laughs> really. So, um Hopefully those are some of the qualities that helped, but there were a lot of amazing people in that process, hard to say. Right, uh, Nick would like to know, what is the first thing you love to do when you come home? Oh, well, right now I'm working from home, like many, many of you. Um, I only go in for kind of mission critical operations, um, which means supporting the people who are in space right now. Actually, there was a really cool spacewalk today if anyone watched it. Um, so I was at the Space Center for that. And the first thing I did when I came home is I spent time with my husband, who's also working from home right now, so my family. And I said hello to my cat. So maybe it's uh, our families that are kind of the, the priority once again. And um, yeah, they're definitely at the top of my list to, to say hi to when I get home at the end of the day. Hi. Peyton, who is eight years old, wants to know how many rockets it takes to get into space. Oh, one if it's a good one. <laughs> but it'll have multiple stages, and each stage is designed differently. So the rocket science and rocket engineering is really cool. I um, if, uh, if you're interested in studying it, I would definitely recommend once you get to university level, you can take all sorts of cool courses in propulsion and, and learn about this. So one rocket, but the way that um, rockets work and the type of propellants that we're using, we just like can barely get there. So much of the mass of the rocket has to be fuel in order to escape Earth's gravity. So they're really interesting designs. And usually there are two to three stages and each stage probably has a different type of engine and likely a different type of fuel as well because the fuels perform better at different um, different portions of the atmosphere, different altitudes. So uh, hopefully one, <laughs> but a complicated one. So the next mm -hmm. question from Linnea, what was your favorite subject in school? Mm, uh, for a long time, actually it was art. <laughs> I, lo I just loved um, being creative and um, drawing and painting. Um, that was a big part of my life for a really long time. Um, so while I was young enough to have a subject which was art, it was art. Um, and I also have a lot of very, I'm very fortunate, I have a lot of creative people in my family. So um, my uncle um, is a ceramicist and a painter and um, another um, family member is a fashion designer and a dancer. So I just, I, I got to benefit from that really creative side a lot. So for a long time it was art, but then once I got old enough to um, take things like chemistry and biology probably became those. And really, again, I can't emphasize enough, engineering is just merging those two, um, two fields. Um, it's such a creative subject and that gets missed out on so much of the time when people think it's just math. Um, math is important, but it's definitely not everything. So um, yeah, art and then shifted to different science later. I'd like to slip in a little question of my own then, and that is, will you take art supplies with you to space? <laughs> that would be great. I would love to. There's actually also been some really cool art projects in space. And you have, you have some supplies there, I think. So I don't know. Maybe there's a craft, craft up there, craft capability. <laughs> so back to the children. 
is engineering or aerospace background necessary for becoming an astronaut or do people with life sciences background, for example, neuroscience also stand a chance? Oh, great question, especially because Canada's first female ast astronaut, Roberta Bondar, she flew to space in 1992, I believe. Um, she was a neuroscientist. So um, there are doctors and life scientists who go to space all the time. Um, you can have all sorts of backgrounds to become an astronaut. So usually they do tend to be focused on science or engineering, medicine and math. But we have people in the astronaut corps who were um, ocean engineers, we have a veterinarian, we have people who studied, um, who are microbiologists who studied um, uh, microorganisms in caves. We have people who were aerodynamicists, we have pilots, submariners, Marines, it's just such a diverse place now. It's, um, yeah, you can, you can really, you should, I guess the, I'm trying to say the best advice if you do want to become an astronaut is not to pick something that you think the astronaut corps is looking for. You should really pick, um, of course there are some, some guidelines, but they're pretty broad. So pick what you love to do and that increases your chances of being really, really good at it and then getting noticed and, um, eventually becoming part of the core. So, uh, yeah, for sure. Life sciences is great. There's tons of doctors and all sorts in the core. Wow. Some great insight there. I hope everyone's <laughs> listening well. Um, I think we have time for just one more question, I think. So I am going to ask, oh my gosh. It's always hard to choose the last question. Time, do you think we have time for two more? I think we definitely have time for two, please. Okay, so yeah. if you couldn't become an astronaut, what would you have chosen? Hmm. Well, actually, I wasn't expecting to become an astronaut. I, I certainly wasn't counting on it. So. Um, I loved um, my research. I love combustion science. I think it's fascinating that we've been using fire and combustion for as long as we've really been a species and we still don't know so much about it. I think that's um, fascinating. So I would continue to cover, uh, to study science, maybe science in microgravity if I was still pretty interested in space, uh, which I am. <laughs> um, and I would like to continue to teach people. So I think being a professor was a pretty good fit for me. And I just want to slip in a comment. I guess in the comments there, Linnea says thank you and she, for answering her question and that she loves art too. Oh, awesome. That's great, Linnea. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so for the last one, I hope you don't mind going a little philosophical here. What is something that is as true on earth as it is in space? As true on Earth as it is in space. Well, That's lots of things. Um, Sorry, lots of things. Being is so different. Yeah, no, I I agree. I think we we have this sort of disconnection, but space really is just an extension of Earth, especially where we go now. We're so when you're when you're up there orbiting the Earth, you're so connected with seeing all these places that you you pass over as you circle a, um, a couple of times during one. 24 hour period, one of our days. Um, I think probably something that comes up all the time and is very, very true is that uh, you have to treat people well. You have to treat people with respect and um, however you want to put that, treat people how you want to be treated or um, always be kind or however you want to, um, to talk about that. But that Treating people with respect is something that um, is absolutely necessary when you fly in space, and I think that it's something that's also necessary when we when we're in our communities, large or small, here on Earth as well. So um, it's pretty good, <laughs> pretty good guideline, I think. Awesome. Well, thank you so so much for being here with us today. Um, Please, everyone, give a virtual round of applause for, for Dr. Jenny Seide Gibbons. And to all of you watching, please let her know how much you enjoyed her talk by commenting here. And um, we do have lots more Summer Reading Club fun still to come, including next week, we will be back on Thursday again. And our special guest will be Summer Reading Club artist Bambi Edland, who will be presenting an animal drawing workshop. And to find out everything that we're doing for you, 
please go to our website at virl.bc.ca and follow the link to Summer Reading Club where you will find all of our events, a link to join our um, Facebook Summer Reading Club group, and you can like our Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook there. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Jenny. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Sheila. This was a lot of fun. Great questions. And it sounds like you have some pretty good stuff lined up for next week. Sounds pretty cool. <laughs> well, 